Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name's Paul Jett. I'm the head of conservation and scientific research here at the Freer and Sackler Galleries. And I'm also one of the curators for the Gods of Angkor exhibit, along with Louise Court of the Freer and Sackler Gallery. This is the sixth lecture in the Aspects of Angkor series. And I just wanted to take a minute and tell you about the upcoming lectures that we'll have. Two weeks from today, Helen Jessup will be here speaking. Helen was the curator for the large Cambodian art exhibition at the National Gallery back in 1997 or 98. Um, she'll be speaking on the architectural context of Khmer sculpture. And then we're going to take a, a rather long break and resume at the end of October. We'll have a Sunday lecture on the 24th of October by Olivier Kunin, who's an architectural historian, and he's going to talk about the reconstructing the ruined Buddhist complex of Bante Chamar. He does this using um, computer graphics, and it's particularly timely right now that Bante Chamar is being restored um, by John Sanday with the support of the Gl Global Heritage Fund. And then the Following Saturday, uh, October 30th, we'll have our last two lectures in the series, the back-to-back, -back, um, beginning at 2 o'clock. Ian Glover will speak. Um, Dr. Glover was one of the catalog authors for the Gods of Angkor catalog, and he's going to be speaking about prehistoric and historic archaeology in early Vietnam. And following his talk, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Emma Bunker on Khmer foundry traditions, new observations. Just prior to that, to those talks on Saturday, the Thursday and the Friday of that week, there will be the fifth Forbes Symposium on Scientific Research in the Field of Asian Art. And that the subject for that symposium is Topics in Ancient Metallurgy. And the first session of that is about Southeast Asia. So Thursday morning, October 28th, from 9.30 to 1.30, there will be approximately five talks on various aspects of um, ancient metallurgy in Southeast Asia. Uh, you can find more information about this on the Freer and Sackler's website and um, the schedule for all these events. Today, uh, we'll have a talk by Janet Douglas, who's a conservation scientist at, here at the Freer and Sackler. Um, Janet's areas of research involve an, a number of topics, uh, but are particularly focused on the analysis of inorganic materials relating to Asian art, such as bronze, minerals, pigments, um, stone, and jade. She holds a master's degree in geology and was a mineralogist at the U.S. Bureau of Mines before coming to the Freer and Sackler Gallery. Janet's done extensive studies of Chinese jade, identifying the mineral types and alteration products, and more recently, she's been working on a number of different, in a number of different areas. Um, one of those is the study of materials of Buddhist stone sculpture from roughly the sixth century, focusing on the Freer's collection, but um, looking at other materials as well, and trying to illuminate the types of limestone and sandstone used for carving at some of the major Buddhist temple cave sites. Um, she's also been working on prehistoric ceramics from central Thailand um, using a technique known as thin section petrography. Uh, her work on Khmer sculpture has been going on since 2004 when she first visited the National Museum of Cambodia. And since that time, she's worked with a number of our colleagues and produced a number of papers on this subject. Most, most recently, um, a couple papers, one in Udaya, the Journal for Khmer Studies, and in Archaeometry. So today's talk, as you can see, the title is Carved in Stone, a Major Sculptural Material of Angkor. So, Janet. I would like to thank you for coming here this afternoon. It's one of the few very nice days, summer days in Washington, so I appreciate you coming into this beautiful but somewhat dark auditorium. <laughs> Uh, my interest in Khmer art started uh, with the exhibition at the National Gallery of Art in 1997 called The Millennium of Glory. 
uh, but it was not until uh, my collaboration with the National Museum in 2004 that I was able to start studying the stone materials uh, of Khmer art. Very little was known about these materials at the time. Um, and since then, uh, we've uh, developed a collaboration uh, with other researchers interested in using technical study to understand Khmer material, stone materials, uh, including Dr. Uh, Federico Caro, who's currently a fellow, uh, a Mellon fellow at the Department of Science, uh, Scientific Research at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, Christian Fisher, who's at the University of California at Los Angeles, Kotzen Institute of Archaeology. Uh, M. Sakrithi of Apsara, the Authority for the Protection and Management of Angkor in the region of Siem Reap. Um, and we're very glad that uh, Federico Caro will be joining us this December as a Forbes Fellow for one year. Uh, and we'll be collaborating on some additional projects focusing mostly on stone from the Bayon period and the source of the quarried material for that, uh, that group, that sculptural uh, tradition. As you've probably noticed from the Gods of Angkor exhibition and the previous talks, some beautiful and incredibly detailed sculptures were created in metal uh, but equally easy to notice and, and actually impossible to not notice uh, is that stone was also a major sculptural material in Khmer art and we see many freestanding sculptures and the monuments at Angkor also intricately carved uh, with, with decoration. Um, and I show here an example of a carving of a lintel on the west entrance of Bante Shre, the Bante Shre temple. Um, and in sandstone, uh, and sandstone was the main material used in Angkor. Uh, it was used extensively throughout uh, the Khmer uh, region, uh, and which is not surprising given the vast material resources of the stone in Cambodia. So today I'd like to talk about some of our research, uh, what we can learn through the study of stone, uh, what we know or what we've learned, a little bit of what we've learned about uh, the stone used by the different periods in Khmer history. Um, we're also addressing specific questions related to sculptural objects and uh, building a database for comparison to, of geological materials to stone sculpture uh, from Khmer uh, art. So uh, what I want to say is there's a story of stone that's emerging, and that is the overarching theme of my talk. I'd like to start with an introduction uh, to the research relating to the study of sculpture using petrographic methods, and that will be about half the talk. And then I'll talk about a little bit about uh, some recent work on ancient quarries in Cambodia, and then uh, about architectural stone and some of the research being done using magnetic susceptibility. Um, and then I'll present some ideas for future research. Angkor Wat is a temple complex in the Angkor region of Cambodia built for the king uh, Suryavarman II in the 12th century. As the best preserved temple in the region, it's one of the, it's the only one to remain a significant religious center uh, since its foundation, first Hindu dedicated to the god Vishnu and then Buddhist. The temple is the epitome of the high classical style of Khmer architecture, and it's become a symbol of Cambodia, even appearing on the national flag. Um, uh, Angkor Wat, however, is one temple within a larger region, which we refer to as the Angkor Wat region. Uh, there are about 40 temples total in this area, and they date from the 7th century to the, 16th, to the 13th century. It covers an area of about 300 square kilometers, uh, and there's no scale here given on the slide, but the, uh, the uh, direction from east to west is approximately 20 kilometers. Uh, the, and here we can see uh, Cambo the, a map of Cambodia, uh, Angkor Wat, the Angkor Wat region uh, lies just to the north of the Tonlesap uh, Lake, and it's about five kilometers north of the modern town of Siem Reap. 
Uh, the National Museum of Cambodia is in Phnom Penh, and um, the stone conservation studio there is, uh, is responsible for uh, ongoing conservation of their collections and exhibition of, of uh, the sculpture uh, in their museum. One of the main reasons so few sculptures have been studied using petrographic methods is the difficulty in obtaining fragment samples uh, from well-attested Khmer sculpture. My petrographic research uh, a few years ago made it possible, was made possible by the result of ongoing conservation work by, uh, that began in 1997, uh, headed by Bertrand Port uh, of the École Française d'Extreme Orient, or the EFEO, uh, at the National Museum. Uh, during his restoration work, Bertrand was able to obtain samples uh, from uh, sandstone sculpture in, in conspicuous from inconspicuous locations. Um, in this study, we looked at 29 of these uh, samples using thin section petrography. Uh, some of these sculptures were severely damaged and have required major conservation treatments so that they could be exhibited. Uh, the stone samples uh, obtained during the treatments come from, however, well-attested uh, sculpture dating to the three major periods of Khmer history, the pre-Angkor period uh, from the beginning of the Christian era to the end of the 8th century, the Angkor period from the 9th to the 13th century, and the post-Angkor period from the 14th century onward. Oh. I'm sorry, here's the National Museum and the Stone Conservation Studio. Um, here we see a, a um, early 7th century Harahara sculpture in the museum collections there. And when it came into the museum, as you can see, it was in many pieces, about 80 pieces total. So it required major reconstruction. Um, in the lower right, you can see a cross section. It's not a it's not a thin section, but it's a cross section um, what, that we're looking at in reflected light um, of a stone sample from this sculpture. And you could see a weathered, a brownish weathered layer on the surface. Um, and weathering of stone is a complex uh, interaction of the surface with water and other environmental factors to some depth within the surface of the stone. Um, the weathered surface consists of alteration of minerals such as feldspar and micas and dissolution of other minerals, uh, most commonly calcite, and deposition of still others. Uh, as you can see here, iron hydroxides it gives a rusty color uh, to, the, to the weathered surface. Research related to the weathering process has been a focus at the Los Angeles County Museum um, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but has not been a focus of my research uh, because with these samples, uh, I had little information on the exact location of where they were obtained and uh, didn't have um, the opportunity to examine the, the objects uh, in detail. Um, but still, this line of research is proving useful in understanding more about the history of sculpture uh, whether they were buried, and in some cases, helping us answer questions related to possible uh, sculptures of unknown date, and uh, uh, also cases of where we may be working with copies or forgeries. To understand the relationship between natural stone and stone usage, we need a very schematic uh, overview of the geology of Cambodia. Uh, on this simplified map, uh, we can see that the country is dominated uh, by a drainage system of the Mekong and the Tonlesap rivers uh, here. Um, and uh, the vast majority of Cambodia is covered with uh, quaternary deposits that result from that drainage system, um, uh, which is shown here in green. Isolated stone exposures on hills and mounts rise from this plain as a result of erosion of Mesozoic rocks. Uh, Mesozoic rocks, in this case, being rocks that date from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous period. 
and it's believed that the majority of the building and sculpture material of Angkor uh, style uh, building is realized using this type of stone uh, and, and specifically the uh, shown by these two formations, the brown and the blue. The brown being uh, the gray, we, uh, French archaeologists have named this formation gray superior. It tends to be a yellow to brownish stone. Uh, I'm sorry, gray superior is a, it tends to be a reddish stone. And the terrain rouge is a yellow to brownish stone. And uh, since Angkor Wat is here, these, for, form, these uh, two formations occurring right here are most likely the source of the stone for, that, for the region. So I'd like to introduce a few basic terms for those who are not familiar with uh, petrography of sandstones. Uh, we're dealing, uh, first of all, with sedimentary rocks that are formed from loose sediment produced through the weathering and breakdown of some pre-existing rock, uh, which been, has been cemented together using a natural mineral-based cement. Uh, if we were to look closely at this rock using a magnifier, or better yet, a microscope, uh, we would see that it, the constituents um, would consist of larger particles we call grain, grains or uh, framework grains, um, some fine grain uh, material throughout the stone we call matrix, and uh, other mineral constituents that are binding the rock together called cement, natural cement. And we can refer to the composition of the stone uh, and when we talk about that, we're talking about the relative abundance of these components within the rock um, and uh, the texture of the rock, which includes the size, shape, and arrangements of the component, uh, components in the rock. Um, here, uh, you can see the petrographic microscope in our laboratory. Um, and the analysis is done using thin sections, you can see here. In this case, these thin sections are on round, round slides. They're often on rectangular slides as well. But essentially what a thin section is is a slice of rock um, that's made by cutting the rock, gluing it down to the slide, uh, the flat surface down to the slide, and then cutting it off very close to the slide and grinding and polishing down to get a very thin surface. Uh, we use point counting methods on a minimum of uh, 200 grains so that we can system systematically count uh, the composition and size and shape uh, uh, data on the grains to get the relative abundance of the components. And we use electron microscopy to get chemical information when necessary. Um, and as I've said, sandstone classi classification depends on the identification of these sand-sized grains uh, using the microscope. In the next few slides, I'll show examples of what these grains look like. Um, grains are identified through uh, their optical properties, such as birefringence, index refraction, et cetera. Um, and they're best viewed in a petrographic microscope uh, in plain polarized light or cross polarized light. And these uh, images are uh, taken in cross polar polarized light. There are three main categories, two are shown here, uh, quartz and feldspar. We have a variety. Quartz is very common in sandstones, and you get a lot of different types and features uh, in the quartz grains, some of which you see here. And feldspar, uh, typically alkali feldspars, the orthoclase, microcline, and also plagioclase. Uh, the third category are the rock, rock fragments, and uh, as I mentioned before, the grains in the sandstone are derived from the pre-existing, the, the weathering of pre-existing rocks. So um, we have an, a wide variety of rock fragments in all the categories, you know, the sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic uh, rocks, some of which are shown here. We also look at porosity uh, t and matrix um, and as I, well, matrix is typically, uh, consists of very, very fine-grained minerals that are difficult to identify. 
uh, using optical microscopy, but they consist, the matrix consists of clay and uh, iron hydroxide minerals, um, and often the whole, the mass is cemented using cal uh, with a calcite cement. Um, now, rock names are assigned uh, to the samples uh, using a sandstone classification system. And there are a number of sandstone classification systems out there. I don't want to get into too much about these different systems or the rock names because they can be cumbersome. But just to give you an idea of what, uh, how, this, how this type of analysis is done, we determine the relative abundance of the uh, components in the sandstone, and we plot them on these ternary diagrams, diagrams where the uh, apexes are quartz, feldspar, and rock fragments. And in this case, the Folk classification system, uh, designed by Robert Folk in 1974, uh, there are seven different categories of sandstone. Um, now, in that first study uh, of the sculpture from the National Museum, I plotted up the, these, the data here on the, the ternary diagram and found that uh, there's, there's a wide range of, well, there's a range of compositions, but they tended to plot generally in the center of the diagram. Uh, but a closer look at the samples, I found that there were some characteristics uh, that I could use to split them further up into groups. And I won't talk too much about this in detail, but I just want to point out uh, that I found this very tight group, um, and all of these sculptures are uh, from the Bayon period. So I uh, worked further uh, to look more closely at sculptures from the Bayon period. And like any other sandstone, the Bayon uh, the sculptures contain quartz, feldspar, and rock fragments. But I was able to identify a few types of grains that I think um, qualify for calling the stone a fairly unique uh, type of stone. Uh, the first being albatized feldspar, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, feldspar laths, which are very uh, acicular needle-like feldspar grains um, that are uh, indicative of a, of a volcanic source, and amphibole, which you could see here. And the presence of these three components together, I think, are very distinctive from, from that stone from the Bayon period. Um, this slide shows a detailed study of one grain as an example. Um, al Albatized feldspar grain, they tend to be, have kind of a mottled appearance in polarized light. Uh, I can't see too much under the scanning electron microscope, uh, but when you do a map, you can see that uh, the, the grain itself com is composed, well, it's a, feldspars are typically calcium, sodium, alumica, uh, aluminum silicate. Um, however, when a grain has been albatized, the albite replaces uh, parts of the grain along, along cracks and fissures. And I think you can see that when you look at this map here. It's more sodium rich just along certain cracks. Uh, this is a low grade metamorphic process um, that uh, is telling us something about the history of the rock. And I found this in many of the samples that I've looked at. Um, in fact, of uh, 13 samples that I studied in total, eight. Uh, eight were from, well, nine total, nine samples were of this type. Eight were from the Angkor region. Um, the others were from elsewhere around Cambodia. Um, so also found one sculpture. Uh, this is a sculpture in the Sackler Gallery. Um, is also of this type. This is a, sam a sculpture that I analyzed some time ago, um, and it's reported on by, in uh, Hiram Woodward's article in the Journal of the Walters Gallery in 1995. Um, and this sculpture is thought to be one of a series of sculptures, 23, uh, that were sent out into the lands by King Jai of Arman VII during the Bayon period. Um, and this is known from an inscription at Preya Khan uh, where this is outlined. So, um, and there are very few of these sculptures still existing. And 
our study has shown that, that uh, this sculpture, even though uh, it's not complete, is of the type of stone that we're seeing in other band sculptures. So this is only a brief introduction to a much larger project, but just wanted to show you that petrography, along with scanning electron microscopy, um, is, uh, and also microprobe analysis, which I haven't talked about here, but it's allowing us to effectively identify one particular type of sandstone that's been used during uh, the reign of J uh, King Jayavarm in the seventh. And uh, this number of samples that we've studied is still too small, but hopefully future work will be able to learn more about the extent uh, of the use of the stone and also the origin of the stone. Uh, another type of stone is shown here in this early uh, Vishnu. Uh, this is uh, a pre-Angkor, early Angkor sculpture. Um, from southern Cambodia. This, well, this particular sample has not been point counted, but it, it, the sandstone has roughly about 65% uh, rock fragments. That's very high. Um, uh, the, frag, the rock fragments are from limestone, and uh, it gives the sculpture the appearance of limestone. That's why I think it, has, it can take this nice polish. It looks almost like a marble or a polished limestone, but it's, in fact, a sandstone. Um, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about quarries. We obtained our first quarry samples uh, through Websara. We got two uh, samples from Beng Mille, near Beng Mille. Um, and uh, you can see, which again is in this area that we think is probably the site of, stone, of the quarries that supplied much of the stone to Angkor. And here you can see a series of photos of some of these quarries. Um, the rock tends to be uh, quarried mostly along riverbeds. The strata is horizontal, and the blocks were taken out along the riverbeds. And in many cases, we have uh, tool marks still preserved on the stone. Um, and uh, I worked with uh, Federico Caro on this project, and he was, uh, well, he's been at the Metropolitan Museum studying their Southeast Asian collections. And uh, the first, well, both of us sort of independently, we noticed that uh, the samples, the quarry samples we had match the Cocare sculpture. Uh, and shown here are the sculpture from the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, it was true also with the sculpture that I was looking at from the National Museum. Um, and you could see that here on this plot, the two quarry samples in black and then the, the sculpture right here. Um, we, but we have to be careful about making, ex making the statement that the, these sculptures uh, were, the stone was quarried from the site because Cocare is around 40 kilometers away from Beng Mele. Um, so we can't really quite, we're not really ready to say that. And in fact, uh, these formations, many of them, and, and in particular this one, the Terrain Rouge, runs for miles and miles uh, and on up into the Cocare area. So we know that it probably comes from this formation, but we don't know where. Uh, we're still far away from being able to determine exactly the quarry site for stone, uh, but we can at least get some information about the formation from which uh, the material was quarried from. There are two other uh, sculptures, I don't want to talk about in detail here, but uh, from Prasat Trap uh, that don't match uh, this, the other stone. Um, they have more rock fragments in their coarser or grained. Uh, there's also uh, two quartz aronites, uh, quartz rich fine grained sandstones. Uh, which were used for lentils. And we found it's uh, not true in every case, but uh, lentils tend to be carved from a sandstone that's very fine grained because that type of stone can take the kind of detail in carving that's necessary to create these intricate designs. Um, uh, in this example, we're looking at a, uh, a stone Again, uh, Bante Shrey, 
Uh, it's a quartz aronite. Um, it's a very quartz-rich rock, and all the samples that we have from Bonte Shre tend to plot up there close to the quartz apex. This stone tend to be used uh, after the, mostly after the 10th century. Um, but there's another type of uh, quartz aronite that tend to, was, tends to have been used much earlier. Uh, it's a coarser grained uh, quartz aronite that's white. Um, and we don't know the extent of the use of the stone yet or where it comes from, but hopefully with more samples we'll be able to uh, get more information on that. Oh, and I forgot to mention that uh, the reason the Bonte Shre sandstone is red is because it's got finely divided hematite or iron oxide throughout the stone. It gives it that uh, red color. Um, the Sackler collections in Khmer art in stone are not extensive. Uh, you, uh, I showed you one a few minutes ago, the Freer and Sackler collections, uh, and some are shown here. Uh, well, mo all of them are shown here. We um, don't, have not sampled these, and I want to just stress that, uh, in order, that to keep in mind that this type of analysis does require a sample, and in order to get a, a, a sample good enough, you know, large enough to uh, analyze about 200 points on the, the thin section, require, does require a relatively sizable sample, not large, probably only uh, a centimeter or so in, di in uh, length, but it, uh, with many of these sculptures, especially the smaller ones, it's difficult to take that type of sample. Um, and now, before I talk more about quarries, I'd like to also just, just make one more point about the stone uh, rock types, the rock types. The, um, most, are, most of the sculptures are sandstone, but there are a few cases of schist that we know of. Um, which is a low grade to, to medium grade uh, metamorphic rock. Um, I've had colleagues tell me about basalt, but I've never uh, seen any analysis of sculpture that have been identified as basalt. Uh, but we know that basalt does occur at one place in the architectural stone, and, the stone, and that's at Asram Maha Rosai. Um, this was first reported on by uh, Manger, Manger in 1936. Um, and there was an analysis done at that time, but I was able also to get a sample from this location. And you could see how much different uh, the thin section of a basalt looks uh, from a sandstone. Um, uh, so in conclusion, uh, for our research, we've been able to start identifying some specific lithologies uh, used in sculpture but we do need to undertake further research and broaden uh, the number of samples in order to uh, create a usable database. Um, now I'd like to start talking about uh, some recent work by uh, colleagues uh, looking at quarries. Uh, this map is from a paper um, uh, by an author with a fitting name. His name is David Rocks. And, uh, he is a PhD candidate at Waseda University in Tokyo, and his paper was on, published on quarrying in 2009. Uh, on the left, he's got, he shows a map. This is actually, the, the map is uh, taken from data uh, supplied through radar, a, a radar mapping of the Angkor region and elsewhere in Cambodia that was done by Evans and Fletcher. Um, but you could see that the locations of the known quarries in Cambodia are uh, correlated with the major temples throughout Cambodia, um, which is not too surprising. Um, still, there's been little detailed study on these quarry sites. Um, on the right, is a very, very general map of the Beng Mille area. The Beng Mille is a temple, these, so this quarrying region is around uh, Beng, the temple there. Um, but it's interesting that one, uh, the, the estimates that have been given by uh, colleagues looking at these quarries, uh, that the enormous amount of stone that was used in the Angkor region does not seem to correlate with the amount of stone that's been taken from these quarries. 
Um, and we think that's because the, the stonemasons would have first chosen free boulders and other accessible large pieces of stone uh, before uh, quarrying into low-lying strata. And unfortunately, uh, you don't have much in the way of remains when that kind of quarrying is done very often. Um, uh, here are some uh, photos of the quarry, some of the quarry uh, areas in Beng Mele. These photos were taken by Federico Caro on a recent trip uh, to the area through collaboration with the Metropolitan Museum and uh, Epsara. Um, and the, usually you typically get very vertical ledges, the steps, and you could see tool marks preserved on the, the vertical surfaces. Um, on the south wall of the outer gallery of the Bayon, uh, uh, you could see a relief of, of uh, a, a depiction of ancient Khmer stonemasons and construction workers extracting stone uh, using chisels and picks and other tools. Uh, we, this is as far as I know, the only real depiction of this kind of activity. Uh, and we don't know much more other than what we see here, but some chisels have been unearthed by colleagues, some Japanese colleagues uh, who've been researching the Bayon uh, temple. Uh, the older methods, it turns out there are a number of methods and there's an evolution of the techniques uh, with time. Uh, the older methods involve creating a, a vertical channel in the stone, as you can see here on the bottom left, um, and then uh, splitting the stone along, using that channel as a, as a groove to sort of split the stone along that surface. Um, and as I mentioned before, they typically would work on um, rock plateaus, riverbeds, uh, idle boulders, that sort of thing. Uh, so we don't always see uh, the result, you know, there's not always evidence of quarrying that remains. Uh, pit quarrying was also undertaken, uh, but David Rock believes that, uh, that it would have been difficult for this to have been used very extensively, especially below about five meters down. Uh, because it's very difficult to retrieve the stone blocks uh, out of a deep pit. And there are also problems with flooding, particularly in the rainy season, um, which would uh, severely limit the uh, working time that they would have to work in a pit quarry. Um, we think that water buffaloes or elephants could have been used to haul stone to uh, Angkor. And in some cases, these quarries are located along uh, canals, so uh, waterborne rafts could have been used also to bring block, blocks to Angkor. Um, these photos are also taken by Federico uh, Caro in his recent trip, and they show very clearly the tool marks that you see on some of these uh, ledges. and. Um, Starting with the image on the left, you can see, uh, I think, how this, I'll explain how the quarrying is done. The, direct, the direction of the working would have been from the right to the left, and the holding of the, each uh, su successive layering of the chiseling would have been along one of these lines, but the chisel would have been held perpendicular to these tool marks, so it would have been split along a um, edge, you know, slanted edge that you see here. And I hope you can see this. This shows quite well, if you can make it out, that um, this is one of these cuts in progress. Uh, it's pretty straight at the bottom and then it curves up, so the worker would have been uh, moving in this direction to split off this piece of stone. Uh, now I'd like to talk about the uh, recent magnetic susceptibility work being done and, uh, and its application to architectural stone. 
Uh, this method is proving to be very interesting and extremely useful in the study of architectural stone, but it seems to have limited use uh, in applicability towards sculpture, which I'll explain. Um, this work is being undertaken by uh, Japanese researchers at Waseda University in Tokyo, and it's been reported on by Uchida and others uh, in 2007. Uh, magnetic susceptibility is um, the degree of magnetism of a material in an, in an applied magnetic field. Um, and this magnetic susceptibility is due to minerals in the rock, most specifically uh, magnetic minerals such as magnetite, um, and other ferromagnetic minerals such as hematite, iron, uh, iron titanium oxides, etc. Um, the data is reported in uh, SI, their, uh, the system, the international uh, system of units. Um, and the measurements are taken using portable magnetic susceptibility meters, uh, which are taken to locate the site and uh, measurements are taken off the various faces of the, the stone blocks. Um, they have been, these researchers have been able to um, estimate the construction sequence of some of these temples, and I'm going to talk about a very simple one here, just so you can get an idea of how this works. Uh, this is Nam Krom, it dates to the 9th century. It's a small temple on the north side of the Tonla Sap Lake. Um, the, uh, the platform has a low magnetic susceptibility of about 1.49, uh, you can see here. And that is uh, called stage one, building stage one. Uh, the three sanctuaries have a, a high magnetic susceptibility, uh, 4.12, 5.19, and 4.69 from north to south. And the North and South libraries have an average of 1.77 and 2.57. Um, so the platform was constructed, as I said, as uh, stage one. Um, and that's been dated to uh, the ninth century based on not only the magnetic susceptibility, but the style of the carving and other features of the stone, uh, such as the bedding layers and the texture, uh, grain size, uh, those sorts of features. Um, the other uh, buildings here, the other uh, were uh, used, were produced using stone from a newer quarry, um, and this quarry, uh, which we call stage two, this newer quarry uh, has uh, has a magnetic susceptibility that's known that decreases with time as it was being used. They've identified the second quarry. And as it was used, the magnetic susceptibility went down so they can uh, surmise what the building order is uh, within that stage two building. So this analysis is complex, um, and it's, it's, there's a lot of data that goes into it that I can't talk about here, but they're using uh, many features. They're comparing uh, temples to each other and looking at the uh, physical characteristics of the stone, uh, as well as the magnetic susceptibility measurements. Uh, they have, uh, they report on a total of 22 uh, sites, 22 temples, um, and their interpretation is, uh, goes along with the chronology that was set out quite early for the uh, age of these temples uh, set out in 1940 by Romasat, and it's been also accepted by uh, scholars today. Um, and they have identified eight phases at, with some subphases of building throughout Angkor Wat, and this is summarized here. And within those eight phases, um, they find uh, seven rock quarries um, that were, were used. And again, I don't think anybody knows exactly where these quarries are. Uh, this is a synopsis of what they found. Uh, there's more work that needs to be done in this area. This is a, a terrific framework to start building upon, but we do need a lot more work. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out here is that 
the magnetic susceptibility measurements for any one uh, quarry is based on thousands of measurements, and you have to actually look at the curve. So if you're working with a sculpture, you find a sculpture ha tends to have magnetic susceptibility units around two to three uh, times 10 to the minus three international un uh, standard units. Um, there is absolutely no way you can tell which quarry that sculpture comes from. So uh, there's a lot of overlap in the data, and I think we need to look uh, on the curves, on the, on the overall curves, rather than individual points. Um, so I think the applicability to sculptures is going to be limited. Um, ideas for future study. Uh, uh, we have uh, laid foundations, and I hope it comes through, to uh, study some workshops. Um, Martin Polkenhorn has been working on this. He's identified uh, three workshops for sculpture uh, that we, that have been, well, they've been identified in uh, the Angkor region. They're overlaying here on a map of, uh, that's from Fletcher and uh, Evans, the radar data mapping the archaeological site of the Angkor region, the whole region. Um, I don't want to go into de too much detail here, only to say that the Hariharalaya site uh, dates to about the 9th century, and the other two, the Angkor Tome workshop and the Nam Dai workshop, date to the 12th century. All three sites have huge amounts of debitage, which are chips from the working of stone. And all three sites have unfinished sculptures that have been found at the site. Um, so I think the study of these materials will be very useful in our understanding of the whole process of the uh, extracting the stone, bringing it to the workshop to create the sculpture, um, and understanding uh, the use of stone in Khmer culture. Uh, here you can see some examples of these unfinished sculptures from Nam Dai. Um, to, uh, to me, these are particularly interest, interesting because they date to the Bayon period, and uh, they could they could really give us help us to gain some insight into the whole uh, complex, uh, likely to be complex system of uh, sculpture production during the Bayon period. And as I've said, uh, we've characterized a particular type of stone that comes that was used during the Bayon period. Uh, we need to learn more about the extent of the stone, especially its source, and this is a topic we plan to focus on in the future. And I would like to also just mention here that uh, this Bayon stone seems to have an unusual type of weathered surface. I've seen this on a number of sculptures, but more, we need to look at this a little more carefully. It has Many of these sculptures seem to have developed a almost a modest, sort of a mottled patina uh, due to a selective uh, weathering of the stone, which I think is related to uh, the types of grains that are in the sandstone and probably those, those uh, feldspar lads. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the study of stone is complex with many layers. Uh, we've now documented the use of uh, uh, certain types of stone, the terrain rouge, the gray superior, and this Bayon stone, and we've found some others as well. Uh, and hopefully more work in the future will lead to a more complete understanding of these magnificent and intriguing works of art. Thank you. <laughs>